it's totally unknown to most everybody that uh, there was a, a battle at sea between two warships, the Confederate CSS Alabama and the Union USS Kearsarge. This was an all-out broadside-to-broadside uh, battle between these two ships, and uh, only one was going to survive. It wasn't like they were going to you know, uh, go their separate ways and we'll see you another day. This was a fight to the death. An excerpt from today's guest, whose latest book details the greatest naval battle of the Civil War. New York Times bestselling author Tom Clavin is here, and I'll speak with him right after this break. I'm Robert Child, and this is Point of the Spear. May 30th is Memorial Day in the United States, a day in which America honors her warriors, and my book, Immortal Valor, is out now. The book chronicles these immortal heroes' life journeys through all the pain and struggle until their ultimate triumphs. I hope you check out the book, available in stores and online, to discover more as we honor America's warriors this Memorial Day. Welcome back. Today's guest has received awards from the Society of Professional Journalists, Marine Corps Heritage Foundation, and the National Newspaper Association. Several of his books have been New York Times bestsellers, His new book is called To the Uttermost Ends of the Earth, the epic hunt for the South's most feared ship and the greatest sea battle of the Civil War. And author Tom Clavin joins us now. Tom, welcome back to the show. Well, thank you for having me back. I appreciate it. This is an interesting battle. I I hadn't heard of the ship or or the battle. And uh, can you fill us in on some background on the Confederate ship, the Alabama? Well, that's one of the reasons why we thought we had a tiger by the tail when we started working on this book, Phil Keith and I, because uh, most people, if if anybody knows anything or thinks they know anything about a naval battle during the Civil War, they would say the Monitor and the Merrimack. I mean, that came up for a lot of people in fourth grade social studies. Uh, it's, it's totally unknown to most everybody that uh, there was a, a battle at sea between two warships, the Confederate CSS Alabama and the Union USS Kearsarge. And it was a full battle. It wasn't like they, they passed by each other and lobbed a few you know, cannon shots at each other. This was, this was an all-out, broadside-to-broadside uh, battle between these two ships, each representing their, their country. And, and uh, only one was going to survive. It wasn't like they were going to you know, uh, go their separate ways and we'll see you another day. This was a fight to the death. And, and it's really... Uh, from an author's perspective, very uh, pleasurable that most people are going to be hearing about this story for the first time. Yeah, because I, I've done several Civil War films mm-hmm. and, and books, and I thought I knew, but I guess I just didn't know the naval engagements. Um, what was the catalyst that made the Secretary of the Navy send the Kearsage after the Alabama? Well, the Alabama had been launched in the summer of 1862, and for basically about a year, it had uh, it had the world to itself in a sense. It was it patrolled the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, even the Indian Ocean, and it would sink shipping, any kind of ship that had uh, cargo intended for a Union port. Uh, Captain Raphael Sims of the uh, CSS Alabama would take the crew off, and he'd set fire to the ship and sink it. And, you know, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of tons of Union cargo were ending up in the bottom of the sea. Mm. And so that by itself, that, 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 you know, we're talking about dozens and dozens of ships that, that were, were sunk, not just a couple here and there. So it was having an impact. I think a big part of it was embarrassment that the, that the Union Navy uh, was a pretty large Navy. I mean, once the, it was... It was fairly large to begin with, but once the Civil War began, the manufacturing ramped up and, and ship after ship were being launched. And yet, and you had the Confederate Navy, which consists of the Alabama and four or five other ships. How is it that we uh, have all these ships, this is Gideon Wells' frustrating thing, and we can't find this one single ship? And I think what really, once he got reports on it that kind of put his, rubbed his nose in it, is in, uh, in January of 1863, I think it was, uh, Sims and his Alabama just showed up. They thought they were going to, you know, poke the poke the uh, the bear of the Union, and they showed up outside Galveston, and they took on a, a Union gunboat, not just a merchant ship, but this was an actual, you know, warship, the mm-hmm. Hatteras, and they sank it. 
And once Gideon Wells got that report, he's, he was like beside himself. He said, we have to find a way to sink, find and sink the Alabama. So he commissioned uh, Captain John Winslow and the Kearsage and said, you know, travel the, to the uttermost ends of the earth if necessary and find and destroy the Alabama. And that was, that was his mandate. And that's, that's what Winslow did for the next 14 months. He had no other, oblig- no other priority, let's put it that way. Than to find the Alabama and engage it in a battle that would end the, the the this preying upon Union shipping. Can you paint a picture of each of the captains, Sands and Winslow? Yeah, they they uh, a couple of things we actually learned more about after Phil and I had pitched the idea already to our publisher, which made it even more enjoyable to work on the book. One was that uh, Sems and Winslow had actually been f- good friends and shipmates during the Mexican American mm. War. So it's almost like something out of a 1940s Hollywood plot, you know, that like you have the two brothers who vie for the same girl. He had the two, they were lieutenants at the time, uh, young lieutenants and good friends and shipmates. And then, you know, some years later here during the Civil War, they're out to, to sink each other's ship. Um, Sims was a more flamboyant. Um, uh, he was referred to in the press often as a pirate. He was kind of a... Um, um, uh, more outgoing, more engaging, more charismatic, uh, uh, swashbuckling kind of ca- kind of character, and uh, and actually a little old. He was in his mid fifties, and oh. that would you know today to be a navy captain in the mid fifties is no big deal. Uh, it's probably pretty pretty commonplace. But when you're talking about the eighteen sixties, when the that was probably already the lifespan of the average American male was the mid fifties, if not younger. So he was he was older than most other of his contemporaries. And then you have John Winslow, who was a plotting, deliberate, uh, careful, disciplined uh, man who was frequently beset by all these various illnesses that kept sidelining him. And so you had two very different men uh, mm-hmm. who, were, who were each each piloting a ship that was their, their, their ultimate rendezvous with each other. Now, Winslow pursued Sims for 14 months and finally caught up with him on the coast of France, Cherbourg. Uh, peninsula why do you think that he finally caught up with him do you think Sems just decided to turn and fight it was really two things um one was uh, due to winslow's intelligence and his doggedness and that was the previous attempts to find and engage the alabama were the captains of those other ships strategy was as soon as they would get a report of where the alabama had been whether it was in the Caribbean or off the coast of South America someplace, they raced to that spot. Well, that was really kind of a silly strategy because by the time they got there, which could be days or even a couple of weeks after the Alabama, the Alabama was gone, long gone. It wasn't going to sit around and say, oh, okay, I'll wait for you guys to, to catch me. <laughs> yeah. So Winslow's strategy was he, he was trying to think like Sims and say, where would he go next? And I'm going to try and anticipate that and be there when he gets there. And many times he, he was too late still. But eventually he was right, and he, he did find uh, the Alabama off the coast of France. The second thing, which goes back to maybe what you mentioned in your question, is that as the Civil War went on, uh, more and more European ports were closed to Confederate ships, merchant ships, and the few frigates that they had. And basically that was because, um, especially from Gettysburg on, and especially get into, into the spring of 1864, it became clear to England and France and Spain and some of the other so-called neutral countries that the South would not win this war. Right. And they did not want to support the losing team. So they made it less, less, uh, they were less hospitable to a Confederate ship that needed to come in to refuel, to get more coal for its steaming, for its engines to do repairs, to, to resupply. So uh, basically what eventually happened with the Alabama, it was at sea for two years, nonstop. You know, I don't think Sems left the ship the whole time because they, 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 they had to keep moving to stay away from an increasing number of pursuers, especially the the, the indefatigable Kearsage. And so when um, uh, when Sems needed desperately to put into port, uh, Cherbourg was really the only place that would let him come in. It wasn't going to be for very long, but at least they let him come in. You can spend a few days. You can get some more coal. Uh, you can let your your crew get a little R and R, but then you have to get out. And it was while he was, you know, in the harbor of Cherbourg that the 
uh, that Winslow and the Kearsarge, who had heard about um, uh, the Alabama being in European waters, uh, arrived off, off, the, off the Cherbourg coast. And Winslow wanted to go right into the harbor and engage the Alabama right there. And the French authorities said, if you do, that'll be an act of war. We'll declare war in the United States. So it was a standoff for a while because the Alabama was inside the harbor. The Kearsarge was steaming back and forth outside the harbor. And it was really Semmes' decision that he sent a message to Winslow through French authorities. All right, tell him I'm coming out. We're not going to let this go on indefinitely. Uh, let's have at it. Let the best ship win. I hope you're enjoying this episode. Next time, author Toby Harnden will be here to discuss his new book, which reveals the untold story of the CIA mission to avenge 9-11. The CIA being sort of straining at the leash to get the authorities to go after al-Qaeda and bin Laden hadn't got them from the Clinton administration or the Bush administration. That all changed on 9-11. And then Kofa Black, who was the head of the counterterrorism center, basically, you know, briefed Bush in the situation room, like, you know, we have a plan. And Bush went for it. That's next time. We've got some great guests coming up in June as we kick off summer on Porn of the Spear. On the first, author Mark Hager speaks about World War II faith and courage in the 357th Infantry. Then Fergal McGarry from Belfast discusses the global impact of the Irish Revolution. And later in June, Lindsay Powell enlightens us on the Jew who defied Hadrian and challenged the might of Rome. All this and much more coming up in June on Port of the Spear. May 30th is Memorial Day in the United States, a day in which America honors her warriors. And my book, Immortal Valor, is out now. The book chronicles these immortal heroes' life journeys through all the pain and struggle until their ultimate triumphs. I hope you check out the book, available in stores and online, to discover more as we honor America's warriors this Memorial Day. Now back to the conversation. I read that he sent that letter to the captain, but he also sent a letter asking to be uh, relieved before the battle. I thought that was interesting. Semmes was like his ship. It was wearing out. Uh, The Alabama after two years at sea was uh, springing leaks, uh, a lot of wear and tear, the storms that it experienced. And uh, sort of, you know, connected to that was its captain, who, as I mentioned before, was in his mid fifties. There's a lot of wear and tear on him. He had the twenty four seven for two years responsibilities of his ship and his crew. And so um, he wanted. I mean, he had done his bit. I mean, he basically he had had a ship even before the the Alabama that had been oh. sea for about a year. So he so he had, it had been three years three years plus since he had been home with his family, with his younger children. He had two older sons who were fighting in the Confederate infantry. Um, And so he basically thought, I I don't think there's anything more I can do. And so um, maybe the way to continue the Alabama and its its pursuit of Union shipping is it's got to have a a fresh, probably most likely younger captain. And I think he was just exhausted. You know, it, it was like, it, you know, whatever you do from this point on, it's really not my responsibility. I've done everything I could. So the Confederate government needs to make arrangements to have somebody take my place. But before that could happen, uh, that's when the, the Kearsarge showed up and Sam realized, OK, well, I'm still the captain. and I'm going to I'm going to do the best I can to w- win this battle. Without giving too much away, because we want people to read the book, uh, The Climatic Battle, obviously. Could you uh, sketch out some aspects of the battle? Well, it was um, um, Sims believed that he his the Alabama was the could take on the Kearsarge. He expected to win that battle. I don't think he completely understood that his ship had a lot more wear and tear than even he knew about, and that the Kearsarge did not have nearly as much wear and tear. The Kearsarge mm-hmm. was better armed. Um, the Kearsarge had a fresher crew. Uh, it also had what, what Sims did not realize, which put him at a disadvantage, is that his ammunition, his, his gunpowder, a lot of his gunpowder had had over, after all these all this time in the hold and the leaking and everything, some of his gunpowder was no longer effective. Oh. So um, he had to go out there with the idea that basically, well, we're still the Alabama, we're still the most feared ship in the world, basically, certainly to Union ships, and uh, I have a, a loyal crew. 
and and uh, we have a lot of energy and enthusiasm, and and we're going to win the battle. Now, now on the other hand, Winslow uh, believed that uh, his ship was the better ship. Uh, he he did think that the Alabama and his old friend uh, Raphael Sims must be pretty exhausted by now. He also did, used a tactic that uh, you know some some of the officers on the Alabama thought was kind of cheating, but they put like chain mail over the sides of the ship so that mm. when the battle was taking place, when, when, when the Alabama finally came out and it was on Sunday, June 19, 1864, that they met in, in, in beyond territorial waters. It was in the Atlantic um, that some of the cannonballs that were being lobbed at the Kearsage were uh, um, um, bouncing off the, the, the chains uh-huh. that were the, so, so not every shot was landing. So the, the uh, on the other hand, the Alabama with its crew were firing two shots to every one shot of the Kearsarge. So it was a it was a furious battle. I mean, at first the, the two ships circled each other like boxers in a ring. I think like seven times they circled each other, and then finally moved in to engage and start firing broadsides. And one other thing I want to mention about the battle is that. Both captains were exposed to, to enemy fire. You know, it wasn't like they were down in their cabins or hiding behind something and shouting orders through a oh, bullhorn. Oh. You know, both were, were complete, they were standing up on 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 things to make themselves even more visible because this way they could better direct the battle. And they wanted their crew to see them. You know, they wanted to see the crew see their captains defying the cannonballs and the and the, and the bullets and everything like that and the fire and the, the smoke and everything because they wanted to that that they thought that leadership could make a difference and uh so it was it was a uh i think also too what we imply in the book is it was also by exposing themselves to the fire and 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 any harm or, or death is that it was also between these two men it was between their ships but between these two men they had known each other before and it had become kind of personal and yeah. and uh, you know ultimately only one could win it was a pride definitely yeah Definitely, there was. The book is called To the Uttermost Ends of the Earth. Tom, thank you so much for coming on board and and, uh, telling us about your new book. Well, thank you. I appreciate your time. I do hope that people, it's again, it's a story that really hasn't been told before. And uh, and I think, uh, you know, my co-author, Phil Keith, he was in the Navy for 25 years, retired as a captain. So it was really a wonderful experience to work on it with him because I, 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 there's few people I know who know more about the sea than he does. Well, I love unknown history as well. And this is relatively unknown, I would say. Right, right. <laughs> That's it for this episode. Thanks again for joining me. Next time, author Toby Harnden will be here to discuss his new book, which reveals the untold story of the CIA mission to avenge 9-11. The CIA being sort of straining at the leash to get the authorities to go after al-Qaeda and bin Laden hadn't got them from the Clinton administration or the Bush administration. That all changed on 9-11. And then Kofa Black, who was the head of the counterterrorism center, basically, you know, briefed Bush in the situation room, like, you know, we have a plan. And Bush went for it. That's next time. And if you like what you hear, leave a review or a rating or just click the follow button. And be sure to check out our Point of the Spear YouTube channel with bonus video material plus full military history documentaries. There's tons to explore, and I hope you check it out. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spear. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.